Hello, beautiful people. I'm Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, and tonight I'll be sharing a few of my thoughts on civic and ethnic nationalism. To be more specific, I'll be considering the widely held and promulgated belief that ethnic and civic nationalism are in some respect mutually exclusive or in opposition. Now that said, it's all just preliminary speculation. I'm still trying to get my head around the various elements. But before we get to all that, I'd like to make a few announcements. The first is that I've opened a Subscribestar account for those of you who no longer wish to use Patreon. I lost a whole block of patrons within the space of a few weeks, so clearly some of you fit into this group. The only problem is Subscribestar itself seems to be having some issues with uh, locking in a payment processor, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. While we're on the subject of patrons, I should also mention that I normally get an email notification whenever there's a new channel supporter. But now it's looking like that is not always the case. It's possible that new patrons are coming on board and I'm not being notified by email. I have to go in and manually review my Patreon account. If you are a patron and your name does not appear in the opening credits, I apologize. And I invite you to let me know either through Patreon or here in the comments section, and I will get that sorted. I also want to let you guys know that I just posted a chain smoke discussion with Tim. It's up over on BitChute Semiagog. You can head over there if you want to check it out. Uh, links in the description box below uh, to the general um, BitChute channels, uh, and you can find it there. I thought I'd have uh, trouble if I posted it here on YouTube, so I did not. And there is another controversial one coming very soon in which Mr. Tim discusses suicide. This discussion was uh, by request from Luciferian Outlaw. If y'all are interested, you'll have to head over to BitChute. Consider subscribing while you're over there. Finally, I want to give you an advance heads up that I will be speaking to Millennial Woes as a part of his yearly Millennial series. I'm very much looking forward to it, uh, to our conversation, which will be live, I believe, on uh, December 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, assuming there are no um, unforeseen hiccups that will occur with the scheduling. Hopefully some of y'all will have the time to drop in and check it out. All right, so now I want to share with you some things I've been chewing on. I don't have any of this fully worked out yet, but there are some interesting odds and ends worth mentioning. I've spent time thinking about civic and ethnic nationalism, and it seems pretty clear to me that not only are they not mutually exclusive, they're in fact complementary. And from the founding of the United States until relatively recent times, prospective citizens had to satisfy a combination of ethnic and civic criteria, never just one or the other. So the first point I want to make is that we're not looking at an either-or decision that can be framed as uh, ethnic nationalism versus civic nationalism. Even if those who want an ethnically homogenous state overcome the problems that come with establishing legally recognized criteria for determining racial categories and quotas or limits, to say nothing of even more unpleasant questions about potentially removing whole categories of people from the country. Even if they jumped through all of these hoops of fire, they'd still have to establish criteria for citizenship that have nothing to do with race or ethnicity. To say it as bluntly as possible, even a hypothetical unmixed group of white people would have to agree on some form of government. They couldn't just say, we're all white and that's the end of it. Some might be communist bitches. Others might be national socialists. Hopefully, quite a few would view our U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights the way most women view their husbands, as the best of a bad lot. Hopefully, many would see our system in the U.S. as the least objectionable form of the necessary evil that is government, or the uh, least objectionable currently conceived, at any rate. So there's no such thing, by my lights, as purely ethnic nationalism. For those who might not have been tracking with me thus far, this is part of why I said earlier that ethnic and civic nationalism are complementary, not mutually exclusive, or in competition. Homogenous ethnic groups don't magically escape the timeless necessity for social contracts wherever groups of men come together. 
thus any proposed ethnic nationalism, will always already be civic as well. To imagine this is not the case would be to imagine that two groups of the same blood who choose to govern themselves differently can still be called a single nation. Isaac and Ishmael, or Ismail, if you prefer, were brothers. Shalom Aleichem and Salam Aleikum sound pretty much the same. They both play backgammon and raise their hands, palms up when they're bitching. And they both like their female singers to have deep voices. But I'm not putting my money down on any single state solution. You dig? If they're already apart, if they're already have, uh, separate groups, they're mortal enemies because of their similarities. And if they start together and grow apart, you know, forking off into separate paths, however similar they may at first be, their country already has the chalk line snapped for the coming partition. My point is that no matter how similar they may be, whether they start apart or grow apart, it's going to be hard to conceive of them as one. Being more or less the same people is not in itself, I think, a basis for national identity. Conversely, we know that nations can be maintained based on uh, nothing but civic criteria, at least for a relatively short period of time. So while civic nationalism can at least temporarily be made to work, there's no such thing as a pure ethnic nationalism. No nation can constitute itself solely on an ethnic basis. Any nation must be further integrated beyond this dimension or facet of ethnicity through religious or uh, political conventions. And when it's a religious mechanism rather than a political one, the religion comes with laws that fill in the political gaps. To, uh, to continue with our previous example of Isaac and Ismail, we can see that different religious views led to these two brothers being seen as the founders of two distinct nations. And with each, as we see with Halakha and uh, Sharia, their respective religious laws, um, there's arguably no distinction between the civic and the religious, that being to my point about how the uh, religious um, distinctions between groups, if they don't have a political dimension, they'll fill it in. Hence the judicial sy systems uh, inherent in Judaism and uh, Islam. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just wanted to cover that as a kind of background. If anybody takes issue with the reasoning, they can tell me all about it in the comments section. I want to move along to some of the more diverting aspects of all of this. I mentioned before that I think ethnic nationalism cannot stand on its own, but what about civic nationalism? Purely civic nationalism has only been attempted over a short period of time, and it's clearly been imposed upon populations rather than spontaneously arising within them. How long has it been since we cut the ethnic nationalism out of the body politic here in the U.S.? It's been a mere 50 years since the uh, Hart Cellar Act in the late 60s. And how is that working out for us? As best I can tell, the moment a nation becomes strictly civic is the moribund moment. No matter how much blind staggering and flailing about happens before it finally succumbs to its self-inflicted mortal wound, even a half century of such stumbling into oblivion. And I don't say this flippantly. I've spent some time thinking about it, and it all comes down to trust. Of course, I'm not the first one to make this observation. It is hardly original, but I myself have spent the time to sort through it, to sort through all of it, to see how I myself feel about it. And it's quite clear to me anyway that uh, no social contract, no national covenant can exist without trust. While blind faith might have its place, for my part, I can say that for me, it has no place in worldly relations between men. The world is full of con men and tricksters, thieves, liars, and certainly most dangerous of all, fools. With such men at large, a basis for trust and cooperation, some basis other than blind faith, must be found. Otherwise, we'll all be living in modern versions of fortified frontier cabins surrounded by blockhouses and picket lines, if we're not already, hoping our family isn't going to you know, be the next one to fall afoul of some scalp-hunting gang of useful idiots. I don't know how many parts of uh, our cities and our suburban areas look to you, but to uh, me, 
the picture looks increasingly divided, justifiably paranoid, and often miserable. Much is made of the broken windows theory about how cleaning up evidence of small crime keeps more extensive and serious patterns of criminal behavior from taking root. But I think the real key to all such programs is simply cleaning up graffiti. It has nothing to do with windows being broken or broken windows being replaced. It's all about the graffiti. It should be called the clean up graffiti theory, as far as I'm concerned. In seeking the origins of writing, I spent quite a bit of time exploring animal territorial marking. And uh, that's all we're really dealing with here, I think. A patchwork of competing territorial claims that just happens to be indicated by individuals and groups with signs in Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, or Korean with gang tags and commercial advertising with minarets, red flags, and cheesy satanic statues of Baphomet in the rotundas of uh, public buildings, rather than with clumped fur, scratched bark, muddy wallows, piss on trees, or uh, neat little piles of scat. We arrived in this situation, at least in part, because we renounced all belief that some national values must be shared by all citizens. This notion has fallen out of fashion, and with little or nothing in common, we're becoming increasingly distrustful of each other. And why shouldn't we be when every day there's less and less that we can all agree is important? How are we to know who really wants to be an American? And how are we to distinguish them from those who instead aim to destroy all cultures, boundaries, and distinctions through subversion of national institution, slithering through the gaps presented by the democratic systems that form the foundation of these uh, national institutions. Well, in the past, we placed trust, some anyway, in oaths. Today, oaths are scarcely even formalities. They mean nothing in many instances, as we see in every facet of life, from naturalization oaths to marriage vows. And even in the past, there was no way of really knowing whether a converso really had embraced his new lord and savior, whether Shiite and Sunni might have recourse to Tekiya with one another or in Christian lands, whether or not one was dealing with fifth columnists, with commies, or with cunning Confucians rather than genuine compatriots. How does one test such things? Perhaps military service is as close as we can come. I'm not, I'm not really sure. As soon as we step outside personal relationships, though, where family members or neighbors can observe a person's behavior over time, there just seems to be no real way of relying upon what someone merely tells you about what he or she believes. Hell, it was only a year and a half ago that I consistently mocked ethnic nationalist ideas. Leaving aside those who simply change their minds, what about the many people who lie with motive and malice aforethought? There's just no way to know. There's a reason polygraph test results aren't really admissible as evidence. How are we to discern what a person truly believes? Maybe someone can come along and share with me reams of research that establishes some basis for reliable ideological testing, thereby opening up the field for some viable, purely civic nationalism. But I don't think it's likely. And in any case, when it comes to my own innate attitudes, I share the sentiments said to have been expressed by Queen Elizabeth I. I have no desire to make windows into men's souls. And I got no time for it, neither. On the other hand, whatever one may say about DNA testing, it's at least possible on an empirical basis. What are we to make of this? What are we to make of the fact that ideological testing seems impossible, whereas genetic testing is relatively advanced and reliable? I agree with the civic nationalists who hold that shared ideology is a much more sensible basis for cooperation. That's why I said ethnic nationalism cannot stand alone. Being, I don't know, surrounded by white people would be no consolation to me at all if I were living in the USSR under Stalin. And yet there is a direct correlation between ethnicity and culture. Certain ethnic groups all across history persistently give rise to specific cultural features. Features like a focus on individuals and individual rights, 
equal treatment under the law for all citizens, recognizing females and males as distinct but entitled to the same rights and recognition, a focus upon exceptionalism and excellence. To be sure, being of a particular ethnic group is no guarantee of these things. If it were a guarantee of any kind, the countries of the West would not currently be riddled with drooling communist idiots. But the peoples of the West are the ones who've given rise to our culture over millennia, including the foul aspects of it like communism and socialism and other such things. Does it not therefore seem more likely, given that we are the ones who gave rise to our culture over all these thousands of years, does it not seem more likely that those who carry this genetic heritage are the ones most likely to preserve its corresponding culture? Hmm. Worth thinking about. I say it again, we cannot accurately determine ideology. When it comes to ideology, we have to accept people at their word. There's no other option or at least none that I'm aware of. On the other hand, we can determine genetics with ever-growing precision. At this point, an old joke comes to mind, an old joke that's also a teaching story, as is so often the case with old jokes. This one is about uh, Nasreddin Hoca, a kind of wise old fool about whom stories are told in Turkey and other places thereabouts. In the story, a man returning home late at night comes across Nasreddin, Searching beneath a street lamp, the man asks if he needs help, and old Nasruddin explains that he's lost his key. The man volunteers to help him find it and quite sensibly starts by asking, you know, where'd you lose it? Nasruddin points to somewhere else off in the darkness, so the guy says, why are you looking for it here if you lost it over there? Nasruddin looks at him like he's a total idiot and says, because there is light here. You grok. You dig, you follow. The ethnic dimension, as any kind of basis for trust, is one I'm skeptical of. Very skeptical. Many of you have heard me say that before. But I'm skeptical of all proposed claims on my trust and allegiance, as all adult males should be. It's the price of being a man, necessarily oriented outwards, with the predisposition to confront or address threats and challenges with a predisposition to throw a loop forward in time using the weaponized imagination, the foundation of all necessary cunning. Each of us has to navigate through the maze of the world of men, on our own behalf at very least, and often on behalf of those we must protect. And when trust is in such short supply, when mad utopian warlords swagger and stagger on all sides, swinging their hammers and sickles against everything hard-earned, hacking and smashing, everything tuned and tested by time, raping the merely good in the name of their unattainable perfections. At times such as these, might it be that the thread of trust that runs, however tenuously, through shared culture and ethnicity, can help us navigate our way through this labyrinth and out into the goddamn daylight. If not, I remain more than willing to hear any convincing argument to the contrary. Get it? Got it? Good. Semiagog, out.